Okay, everyone, uh, ni hao, and good evening to this session, the penultimate session of Mesoscon 2016 Asia. Uh, it's great to see the turnout today. And uh, I would start, what would start? Can you just trigger the mouse, please? Yeah, okay. So the title of the session is how we could use Mesos to drive DevOps. And uh, before I dig into the session, I want to give you a small introduction of who I am and where I work from and where I come from presenting this conference. So I am part of GS Shop, and uh, GS Shop is one of the largest TV shopping uh, networks in Asia and now one of the largest e-commerce sites in Korea. So we've been in the business for the last 20 years and we have over 1,000 employees and a million and a half uh, users every day and 28 million uh, app users on an average. Uh, so we are based out of Korea, the headquarter is in Korea, but we have a uh, lot of presence in Asia, including India, Vietnam, Malaysia, and other countries. So I work for the container platform team, and my interests are on DevOps, containers, microservices, uh, you can call it the buzzwords of uh, 2016. And uh, I work for the IT Innovation Center. So a slow point to touch upon is, this is a Mesoscon conference and it's 4 p.m. It's the last day of the conference. Why we don't have a talk on DevOps yet? So this is all missing, right? So every conference these days, you have a talks on the DevOps. So this is that talk. Uh, I hope some of you may be missing that talk uh, all this while. So this is a talk that I'm going to cover about DevOps. And my pitch, is basically to talk about why Mesos is a DevOps enabler. How we are using inside GearShop Mesos to drive uh, DevOps across our teams for the last one year. So, uh, how many of you have read uh, this book from Leo Tolstoy? Anyone? Okay, so there's a nice quote in this book and it's quite popular. And it's about happy families. It's quite applicable in the modern times. And happy families have common characteristics. And unhappy family is very really unhappy because of their own reasons. It's very unique to them. If I apply this to teams, especially software teams in organization, I could just make it productive teams are productive and they're common to cross all productive teams. But unproductive team is basically unhappy because of their own reasons. Something very unique about how they operate, how they do business. So the reason to put this out is basically I'm going to talk about how, as an organization, we identified where we were doing wrong and how Mesos became the DevOps enabler for our organization and where we are going next. So my definition of productivity is basically happy teams, happy, fulfilled, satisfied teams. That's what we define inside GearShop. So let's start by putting some agenda across you. I have four part agenda today. And I'm going to bit start with a little bit of history. Some of you may not like history, but actually it pays to pay interest on history for a bit. And I'm going to start talking about where we move on from there, the starting of the change happening in the organization using Mesos, and from there, what we are doing now, how we are adapting this across our teams, across the entire organization. And lastly, where are we going next? How we are making it, uh, how we are driving this internally to take the next leap in the equation. So we start with a little bit of history. So the history begins with how we do build and deployment. Of course, the common things. It's a very familiar uh, artifact that you see all around. So we build something, most of it is the Java shops, a lot of people are building Java applications. And obviously we have a maintenance team trying to support whatever applications are being moved over to production and across environments. And these are some of the stats that we currently have. So you look at some familiar terms like lead time, that is from the origin of that particular requirement till uh, the application or, or, or the change going in production. And then you have per developer per week, how many changes that we go. So this is an important metric to understand where we are in the current equation and where we started from in this space. Now, I want to introduce two important characters of my story today. And you may have heard of these stories. Some of you may have known about these characters. One is a developer, the other is operations. So these two individuals and these two roles have a divide, as usually you read it in the books. 
And it's a device based upon their assumption of the goals in an organization. So the DevOps actually is a culmination of efforts to unify them, as you have already known. So the developer and operations are driven by separate goals. Their goals are separate because that's what they're measured on, and that's where they are uh, penalized upon. So we, as a developer, we look at new features, fast moving to production, and the operations need stability. They want strict control on how changes move in and out of the environment. <coughs> So monolithic apps, operations love it because it's a very simple, easy to understand primitive and there are very less moving parts to it. So when we started looking at microservices and multi-apps, this kind of creates a conflict for them because there are so many moving parts of the equation and there are some new primitives to learn. So they obviously don't have a nice time with these services. And we practice something called yawn-driven deployment. As you know, deploying at 3 a.m. in the morning. So that's what we were doing uh, a long time. Everybody gets together at 3 a.m., it's a party, so we deploy and we have a lot of yawns and that goes to code goes to production. So this was a common tendency inside our organization for a long time. So you now you have seen where we were. I'm just quickly going to the next part of where we started looking at the change and how we identified that change. The first rule of making a change is to know the issues that we have. And I start by looking at these issues internally. You may have heard this term already many times, and I'm going to repeat it. We love to have pets. Pets are very important. But unfortunately, we have machines as pets. And we like to name them and take cater to them. And obviously, then they die painful. So the same context applies in here as well. We, keep it, we love our machines so much. We also have a lot of teams inventing their own tooling and processes, which means they take whatever works for them and just apply, including processes. We also take, find out that a lot of our developers are taking a long time to get feedback when they put something in production, a very com common familiar situation in large organizations. Big Bang releases are like events. They're like everybody's prepped up, they're religious events. And uh, that's like been happening for a long time in the organization. And lastly, the empathy part, especially when we're driven by separate goals, if they're developers and the operations, they are having different ways of dealing with uh, their roles and the roles of the others. And that creates this great divide that I talked about. So we looked at the issues, and now we need to find some inspiration. So for inspiration, we start looking into history, and we, anybody can guess who is this gentleman? Okay, no problem. So you may know the name Conway, but full name is Melvin Conway. So Melvin Conway created this Conway's Law, which you might have heard. But there's a twist to it. So what we look at Conway's Law is around producing designs which are mirror of the communication structures, the way organizations are divided internally. And we want to take a flip to it, to take this as an advantage for us. So we want to flip this by creating called the inverse Conway maneuver, a common familiar term for DevOps professionals. So the inverse Conway maneuver talks about creating constraints that helps and drives the organization to change. So it's basically system-based thinking, allowing systems to influence how we do and may how we communicate inside the organization. So we looked at inverse Conway maneuver, and the other motivation comes from the O-ring theory of economics, which uh, last year, Adrian Coller of Spring Source talked about it in his very familiar blog, and he coined the O-ring theory of DevOps. To make it simple to understand, he talked about two key concepts. First, everything in a DevOps process, in a workflow, every step has to happen, it has to be successful, even if in a small quantity. Otherwise, you don't get the advantage of it. And if any one of these steps is not done properly, or there is an inefficiency, that kind of destroys the benefits of the entire workflow. So this applies to a lot of internal practices that we have, and this is what we observe running our teams for so many years. So based on that, we looked at tenets. How can we create the tenets based on which we could drive this change inside our organization? So there are five tenets. So five tenets, first is to make our applications disposable. Uh, secondly, 
focus primarily on improving the quality of life for a developer. The developer must have amazing productivity inside your organization. The third, allow applications and services built inside to share as much as possible. Make them run on a multi-tenant environment and allow them to use common tooling. Fourth, manage human primitives like killing service, starting up, restarting services, relocating across different box. These primitives needs to be automated as much as possible. And the fifth, and the most interesting point, measure everything. So based upon these five tenets, we wanted to drive all the changes around DevOps, and I will talk about how Mesos kind of plays the most important entity in that, in that adoption. So the master plan is simple. We take the ideas from inverse conflict maneuver and the ORing theory of DevOps. We created this five tenets and we apply. It's that simple. So based on that, we created the platform called the Gravity. It's the service delivery platform which we started last year. And it's to make it very simple, these are we are just making the building blocks for our teams to build software on it. So the end-to-end -end workflow in this is quite simple to make it uh, to the audience that we have here. So we have a build process, which obviously generates your artifacts, in this case, the Docker image, and then it goes through a preparation phase. So preparation phase generates your deployment manifest, which is then sent over to scripts and tooling to allow our applications to move into our Mesos cluster and allow these load balance to reload and DNS to be kept updated. A very common, familiar Mesos adoption scenario that you have seen, that you may have seen in your teams, in your organizations. And along with that, there's a standardized tooling for common aspects around APM, around logging, around dashboard and notifications. So this is what developers get out of the box for every service that they build inside our organization with this adoption. So we want to have a common manifest to rule all the environments. When I say environments, it could be any, any permutation and combination of these. So we want to have a single environment with a manifest that we could use for all our deployments everywhere. And for that, we wanted to make our deployment template as, uh, as common as possible and allow the change parameters in this deployment manifest to be managed by a template engine. So what we did was we externalized some aspects that vary across environments, and that used to generate the final template, which is then pushed, to, pushed over to each environment. So this template is nothing but the marathon JSON configuration, which is obviously having some templates that are, gen that are replaced at one time in our case. We also follow Bluegreen deployment, so we use the Marathon LB project and the zero downtime script that we uh, got from the project to follow and to allow uh, zero downtime deployment on our teams, and that's been working uh, very well till now. When we say zero downtime deployment is basically ideally zero downtime deployment, as you do know in your organizations, it's not 100% zero downtime, uh, but we are trying to make it as, as uh, less uh, downtime as possible. And the primary purpose of the zero downtime is to deploy when we are awake, not the odd hour of getting up and deploying. And that's been very fruitful in allowing our teams to get the confidence to move ahead in this adoption process. We do notify of every step, so we use Slack as our audit log of everything that happens in our infrastructure. So we, in, in terms of builds that are created, the notifications for the marathon infrastructure, so everything goes into the Slack channel, so it's searchable. <laughs> and it's trackable and you can find out what happened at what time. And based on that, you can filter down to the events that you would like to pass on to your operations or the developers or the SREs in your team. Uh, we also have custom dashboard that we built inside our team. And this custom dashboard allows us some new capabilities over Marathon, uh, especially around metadata-based rollbacks. So we would like to go back to a version not just based upon a build ID or a version comment, but also in terms of build. And we wanted to control it end to end. So we introduced metadata-based rollback into our dashboard. We also support multiple sites, multiple regions, which means we have multiple uh, Mesos cluster uh, running across different availability zones, and it allows us to manage them all together in one dashboard. And we use comprehensive uh, health checks. So we leverage the marathon health checks as well as the HA proxy health check and give a common indicator of the service health 
for the developers. So that when I deploy an application to an environment, I get a sum of all the head status together, not just, just the marathon head status. Okay. Lastly, everything is available through as an API and CLI to our team, so that they can take advantage and integrate with their infrastructure, with their other integration points in their pipeline. Uh, Puppet Labs, obviously, uh, most of you have heard about it, and they publish this state of DevOps report every year. And they talk about number of times deployment uh, difference between organizations which are high impact, high performing, versus the ones which are laggard. And one of the common aspects is the amount of times the high performing organizations are doing more deployments than the others. And we wanted to take this as we apply these practices internally. So we also take advantage of this by measuring information coming through the marathon events and pushing it down to our metric collector and that helps us to gather information, information to provide to our teams. For example, you can see the deployment counts, average time for deployment, end to end for all their environments. We also provide monitoring and this is, means that all developers, every team using this platform is able to get this end-to-end -end stack so that they can take advantage of it uh, with their systems, with their services that they are building. And this means end-to-end. -end. So we use a couple of familiar options that you may have seen. Uh, we use Prometheus, Monet, uh, and use for APM integration with uh, Pinpoint and Scouter for our APM needs. And we put, have used Elastic Stack heavily inside our organization. Uh, this is a screenshot of the Monet service dashboard and our Prometheus dashboard making material. Fault identification, and this has been one of the impacts uh, for this transition in, in our teams. When I talk to our developers and we tell them not to worry about where your machine is, where your container is, the most important question is, what happens if something is wrong? Because I want to log into the machine and see what's happening. And that practice took some time to change it. So what we do is ask our teams, follow the inverse Conway maneuver to force them change their practices around the system. Now they obviously have the business trace IDs which they generate in the application, but we bind it to the actual application and the container running in the Mesos cluster. So for example, you can look at the Kibana dashboard, find out the exact Mesos task ID which is generating that log, and obviously you could go to Marathon dashboard and take actions on it. You can kill and kill and scale your applications, whichever is appropriate. So that's around fault identification in our environment. Most importantly, uh, this created an un indirect effect on our teams. Our teams started creating more environments. They loved it so much, they would have environments for every new deployment and they were creating too much of it. And obviously we had a mix of public cloud and in internal infrastructure that we manage. And creating this, uh, making it easy for our teams to deploy services means there are too many of these environments lying around. So we created transient environments, which means uh, we time out environments at a certain interval, which is configured on a cluster. So we have a service which basically goes on deleting the dev and test environments after a pre-configured out, out time. This allows our teams to have a check on how much resources they're using and also creates a discipline. And this creates a lot of good benefits to our infrastructure team as well, because now they see good resource utilization and the disposability part is enforced on the teams, which makes them more strict in how they use resources. So we practice this currently in our production, not in production environment, but in the dev and test environments. Uh, when we deploy this stack, suppose we're teams, we are deploying the stack on a given infrastructure, whether in public cloud or internal IDC environment, we want to standardize how we deploy that. So we have basically zeroed on to two nodes. One is your uh, master node and worker node. So master node, as you may have seen, it's basically the Mesos master and some related services and the worker node, which is the agent, and it has some package services. So this allows us to simplify how we deploy our infrastructure. So some of these services in the worker node may change, but overall, this creates a template for us in deploying our Mesos cluster, the Gravity platform, for our teams. So which means we can manage an entire feed using the package repository and create various worker and master nodes evenly. And some of these worker nodes 
would basically hold on to the application, the business services that the developers deploy, and some of it runs a system management, for example, our continuous integration server or backing services. So some of the familiar tools that you may have already used or seen in your organizations, uh, we also use them. Now coming to the third and important part of this presentation, we're about adopting the change. And adoption of change is really hard. So uh, last month, an article came in InfoQ about why it's so hard to install DevOps and Agile in Asia. Uh, there are many reasons, and I believe that all the reasons have a check on it because I've been operating this in space for the last 10 years. It's really hard to do DevOps and Agile in the right manner inside Asia. And primarily, this has to do around mindset, the culture. So we hope to have inverse convey maneuver as a way to drive these changes, but the first thing to change is the mindset. So we created this simple adoption graph. So when we look at any pro develop deployments or adoption of DevOps practices, we try to follow this adoption graph, which means at the beginning, you're in evaluation stage, and then you'll start putting something in production so that you get some feedback. Teams get some confidence that this thing works. And once you reach a confidence in a production environment, you would like to then see, you like you likely see a tipping point. That's a point when your team starts majorly using these services in all projects and all services. So currently in our evolution, we are in the experience and production stage, which means we are trying to give our teams the benefits and they are actually acknowledging that benefits that are coming out through the Gravity platform. Once we reach the tipping point, that's the opportunity for us to ensure that this goes to scale, this goes to widespread adoption across our teams. And there are three important components of that playbook, the adoption playbook, as I say. The adoption playbook first is obviously getting the confidence in a technology like Mesos, like the Mesos stack and DCOS. Second, we don't deploy it just for new services. We also do it for existing applications and do it in a manner which shows them the difference between the old style and the new style. So doing a compare and contrast mode for that technology. And lastly, we create teams and we create new roles for people to take up opportunity in this transition. So let me talk about this in a brief in the next few slides. So when we put for things in production and we move systems to this new environment, there will be a stage where the old and the new stays together. In our case, when we moved our product critical systems on the Mesos cluster, we had, an op we had a chime where the teams were really not confident that this thing really works. It, it looks great, it works great, but I don't know if it's able to take on the load and especially work with our teams. So that's the of time that where the present and the future remains in the same space which means we use the old system and the new system for brief time. At this time, we follow four ideas to align and help with this transition, which is the old deployment, specifically around VM-based or physical machine-based deployments, and the container-based deployment actually are unified. So in our case, we use a single deployment channel and which deploys both the virtual machines that run our services as well as the Mesos cluster that runs our container. We use common notifications for them so that they don't have to worry about two different systems throwing information to them. And centralize the logging and the, and the monitoring aspects of the system. Which means I don't want my teams to have to manage two different style of management services just because we are in the transition phase in, the, in, the, in our organization. So we did these four things and this is kind of threw away because we needed to go through this transition phase. As we go into the future where everything runs on the Mesos cluster, we might not have to reuse this throwaway part altogether. So compare and contrast also means putting both the old style and the new style services, containers and VMs in the same environment and allowing our applications to move gracefully to the new services. So in our case, uh, this is a representative diagram of how we run some of our services. So we have some legacy monoliths, which are now containerized and run on the Mesos cluster, but also run on the VM environment. And we move between the launch to confidence, which basically means we move traffic between them so that uh, a particular percentage of traffic moves to the old environment and the rest goes to the containerized environment. 
This has trade-offs, but it also provides us the basis for proving the technology. So everything becomes mainstream, everything becomes stable. That's the time where we move everything, all the 100% traffic to our new environment, which uses Mesos. And regarding roles, so we created new roles, and these roles have to work with our existing team structure. So in here, you can see there are two teams, and we instill uh, some cats. We also have a separate platform team, that is basically the platform engineering team building this Gravity platform. And what we do is, we created three parts to it. One is service engineering, platform infrastructure engineering, and the developer advocacy and solution architecture. These, the solution architecture and the developer advocacy works with our different teams inside organization. They do the outreach for our teams, which means they go out and help them go, go and adopt these services. So that's needed for an organization of our scale to make this in production, to allow the change happen quickly. And we also have so-called evangelists, DevOps evangelists installed in teams these are point of contacts who can work with our developer advocacy teams so that they can become a way to distribute the ideas and enforce constraints within their teams. And that helps us to move across many teams at one stage and with a smaller footprint of the platform team. What happens now is because of this practices, the operations and the developer start mingling their goals. They try to understand better which means the operation spends more time building self-services and developers start using those self-services instead of a manual interaction between them. And because primitives are automated, operations don't waste their time building and doing manual, manual changes and manual activities over that. Lastly, they have shared goals with dev, the operations one, and the developers have shared goals with the operations. This is important to do that, that adoption Otherwise, the change just remains a technology change, not a culture change. What are these shared goals that I talked about? The shared goals in practical are three, and our teams are rolled around these shared goals. We want the, all the operations and developer to zero into that shared goals. So first is, both developer and operations have a goal to reduce the time that takes the code from a check-in to production. Everybody works to improve this timeline. Second, we want releases to happen anytime, as, in, as when it's needed, not at 3 a.m. in the morning. And lastly, reduce unplanned activity, especially doing work which is uh, around uh, downtime or issues that can be automatically managed by <coughs> our services. So every opportunity that we get around unplanned activity goes as an automation task into our JIRA so that everybody can take look at that and then start working and improving that activity. So these three goals helps our developers and the operations to unify how they operate inside the organization. And some reality checks. So what happens because of all this is instead of allocating a VM to a service, we let the software decide and operate that. And which means we don't do upfront capacity meetings basically many, many days of just meetings and going in meetings just to understand how, what capacity you allocate and we get more work done. Secondly, we also make availability and fault tolerance from a manual map practice to more automated, let the software decide by itself thanks to Mesos. And which means we don't, don't have more opportunities to do manual intervention. Third, uh, time to production, and that's an extremely important metric inside our organization, Instead of being blocked by manual, monotonous work, we get minimal work, manual work, and this means we get more self-service inside organizations. And that led to something remarkable, which means the teams, especially developers, for them the ops work becomes more accessible. They don't have to learn new skills, they just have to probably call an API or use a dashboard or CLI to do that for that by themselves. And lastly, the important reality checks because of this transition is because of the reusability that we lacked. Now, we are standardizing across all workloads inside our organization, which means uh, all our teams use zero in a standard stack, and they don't have to reinvent these processes by themselves. 
So this is the four reality checks that we currently have inside our organization. But DevOps is just not that. It's also about architecture. It's also about design. And obviously that leads to some new design principles that our, we work at, we advocate to our developers. So the, the work that you see from our solution architecture and developer advocacy, they work with the engineering teams to drive these four in a design phase and architecture phase. This means you need, as a developer, you need to make ops-friendly code, which means your code is monitorable, you can, it's built to log, built to debug. And everything generates metrics. Every code that we write has a capability to generate a metric and be collected and aggregated and shown to the user at any time. Lastly, uh, very cliched, but obviously important, failure-driven development. It basically means failure is an important component. It's not a surprise, but it's an acknowledgement. This means we try to tell the teams that your container can relocate or could die, which means we can even apply Netflix's ideas of Simian Army and your containers may die in the environment. And this is very easy to implement in one case is where the dev and test environment, where you can just remove the environments and they say, hey, I was testing it. I said, sorry, just create a new version of it and just un or a new copy of it. That creates a tension, but I think that's a constructive constraint applying the inverse Conway maneuver. And lastly, around distribution. Uh, most engineering teams came from an era where everything was running on one box. So trying to adopt that now everything is distributed is a drastic shift, what Mesos brought to us. Instead of creating this notion and edge by just education, now we have a platform where they, when they put their code, it's just distributed from day one. The containers can move across the cluster, so everything that they read in, they read in books is actually in practice, so that it becomes more visible and more uh, easy for them to apply in their day-to-day -day activity. So what's next, where we are in this whole equation? So the road ahead will give you some glimpse of where we are and what ideas were we pursuing to take this further. Number one, we'll obviously need, uh, right now we have independent clusters of our environments, not because of technical reasons, but more political reasons as in a large organization, but we wanted to zero into multi-tenant cluster, which basically means we run most of our teams not to own machines or not to own servers rather than run on a singular cluster. And for that, we're taking advantage of some of the primitives that Mesos is building around multi-tenancy and what DCOS, DCOS is trying to offer, especially around isolated, uh, around isolation primitives and uh, uh, around resource reservation. And these are important for us to drive some of the multi-tenancy aspects across our application in, inside our infrastructure. And the other point that we are working is on the global workload allocation, which means everything inside GS Shop, everything is a container, and everything runs on a Mesos cluster. Now, with that assumption, we want to have a global workload allocation, which means workloads of any type. But as you know, not all workloads are same. Basically, they have different attributes. So I would like to classify them in three parts. So there's a cost-based, performance-based, and isolation level. So if you're running a dev environment for some low critical application, you will not need strong isolation. You can just have a limited isolation and still take advantage of it. But for, for example, an application that is using customer data, and because of some regulation, they cannot be used on a single Mesos, Mesos agent or cannot run on the same box, on the same VM, that also classifies for another type of workload. So what we would like to do is allow our data center fabric, which is running Gravity platform using Mesos, to allow workload to be intelligently scheduled on different type of machines, different type of agents, based on the type of workload that they have. So if you have a workload which is around less cost but more performance, and it can go into a particular type of Mesos agent, while a workload which is not very fancy on isolation can remain on very tightly dense systems. And this is a very important initiative that we are driving internally in the next year around global workload allocation. 
And that means we take advantage of what's already there. Example, Netflix Penzo uh, library that they have built that allows us to build new primitives inside how we schedule applications over Mesos cluster. And that's the direction that we are doing. We are building a recommendation system for workloads that are deployed on the Mesos cluster. This means it's just not the profile of that application, but also the cost efficiency comes into the picture. For example, if I'm deploying a particular unit of application as a container on Mesos, I would like to also see which is the right place for me to deploy this service in the Mesos cluster. Think of this like a trusted advisor of AWS, if you have used one. So similar concept on the Mesos cluster, which means billing system gets integrated into our deployment choice. So as a developer, I don't have to pick and choose which is the right data center or Mesos cluster for me and the choice of Mesos agents. That becomes a part of scheduling itself. That's a grand vision there where we want to go into the next year with what we are doing in the gravity system. And we have some work uh, pending around and also the community looking at how we can leverage that over Marathon as well using the Fenso support. We also run a B2B2C platform on our Gravity platform. And that basically means we can give out our customers an ability to run their own e-commerce sites. And that allows us to also build new capabilities on Mesos cluster, which means if I give a free account to someone, I would like to probably schedule that account on a very densely populated Mesos agent. While an enterprise customer with strong isolation and needs could get allocated to less dense, more, more uh, quality of service to that particular uh, customer. That means we need to now think, rethink about how scheduling happens. It's not just the resource offers, but also about how much densely that particular node or Mesos agent is occupied with. And that was, is something that we are trying to approach as we deploy our B2B2C platform on the Mesos cluster. And it allows us to invent over Mesos to build these primitives. And as we build, we also would like to take it out and push that to community. That obviously leads to cost reduction that we can pass on to the customer who are, who are running their stores and e-commerce sites on our platform. Lastly, the next steps that we have is around giving an ability for our teams to do architecture A and B. So we piloted WAMP as one of our uh, s services that we try to leverage to provide us capabilities over Marathon, which means we can do Canary-style releases as well as do architecture A and B very easily. The other point that it gives us is around automated workflows for testing at our systems, which means uh, we could provision the applications on the Mesos cluster over Marathon but the, the, it goes through the WAM, and the WAM's DSL takes care of it. Lastly, we also want to take advantage of self-healing and automated rollbacks capability built inside WAM that leverages Marathon for that, which means when you deploy a new version of your application, and that version leads to more 500 errors that are obtained in the probably elastic search, WAM would automatically roll back that change to the previous version because it knows that it has reached a threshold of issues. So this is capabilities that are already out there and you can take advantage of it. And this is something that we are very keenly putting inside our platform next year. So we covered all aspects of what we have done, where we started from, and it's still day one for a gravity platform. We're still we are making it, taking a lot of steps to do this change. And change is possible. Change is really possible through the efforts of the Mesos community and uh, the DCOS and the Mesosphere guys. But change is hard. But if you need to know the proof of change, that this change is really possible, you may know it this week when Microsoft joined the Linux Foundation. So that really proves that change is possible, even if it takes a long time. So we are driven by that ideology that change will happen, and that brings me to the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions with what we are doing, or you need more uh, information, 
please uh, do so. And I will also be around. We can catch up after the uh, conference. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how do you uh, characterize noise table? You mentioned noise table in one of your slides. Mm -hmm. What are the parameters you use? Just, is, it, is it just a network or something else? See, the noisy neighbor is more loaded terms. For example, it's just not about reservation that we give to a particular tenant, but also about how much utilization a particular workload happens if it's in its peak time. So for example, when, I when we deploy, we have one of our applications that is running our order system. So when we run this application for some time, we understand how this application has been performing for a certain duration of time and how early it peaks. Now when we deploy some other tenants on the same Mesos agent, uh, we want that particular, particular tenant to not just have an isolation of performance, but also in terms of the tooling it could reuse. For example, we have log aggregation services on it. Now, log aggregation runs through the, the same agent through a Docker containerizer. Now, when I try to reuse the same logging system for the other tenant, that may create issues with respect to how would that tenant would want to share their information. It may contain customer data. It may contain data that they do not want to be mixed up with other tenants. So for me, noisy neighbors means one, one of the aspects is just resource isolation. The other is your behavior isolation in terms of how, what you're doing on the application. The other is around data isolation and the management service isolation. So for example, I could even deploy a separate log service, a log rotator and a log forwarder for that particular tenant, which is completely isolated for the other tenants. So think of this like a sidecar container that basically works for a particular tenant and it's sticky to that particular tenant. So that there is no issue of mixing traffic and allowing a common aggregation system to pull in the data. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, we, we can discuss it outside. Thank you.